Cisco, una pregunta. ¿Això de mini, mini, mini Cisco? Mini? Cal aclarir que l'ordinador es deia mini 6, no mini Cisco. I de fet era més alt que jo, també. Com la Cira. Sí. Porto trampeta. Vinga, si et sembla, Cisco, deixem l'anècdota, continuem amb l'acte, perquè avui tenim entre nosaltres el doctor Roger Shang. Ell és un guru, com ha dit abans el senyor Ramon Ollés, sobre nous mètodes d'aprenentatge i d'entorns i learning. I a més a més, alerta, perquè recordem també que des d'ahir és president del nou Institut de Learning Sciences de la Salle. Sense més, donem pas a la conferència magistral que porta per títol Nou paradigma socioeconòmic, la revolució dels models educatius. Doctor Shang, when you wish. Good evening. I hope you understand English. I will try to talk slowly but I'm from New York where people talk very fast like this. So I will try. Thank you for coming here. And I must say this has been an extraordinary week for me. Uh, I came here knowing very little about uh, La Salle and only a little bit about Ramon, who I had met on two different dinners. But I must say that I find Ramon one of the most extraordinary men I've ever met. And you're very lucky to have him. Ready to go? I came here to talk to you about the scenario-centered curriculum, which used to be called the story-centered curriculum, but I hear it doesn't translate so well into Spanish or Catalan. The story-centered curriculum is very simple. We want to change the notion of what education is about. I am a radical in education, and I will upset you. You will not be happy with what I'm saying, but I hope when you go home, you'll think about it a little bit. Does this work? I knew it wouldn't work. <laughs> okay. Why isn't education in school exciting? When you think about going to school when you're a small child on the first day, you're very excited to go to school. Maybe that's true on the first day of university, too. But during the course of school, we tend to not think it's exciting. We tend to think it's hard work and not fun, and we have to do it to get certified. I've been a university professor for 35 years at three of the top 10 universities in the United States. I never found my students extremely motivated to do anything other than graduate and have a lot of parties on the way. <laughs> Is school not so much fun and not so interesting and not so exciting because we don't understand how people learn? So I'm going to give you a short talk inside my talk called Seven Things to Know About Learning and Seven Things to Know About School. I actually don't people believe people can learn from lectures, and so I try to keep them so simple that it's possible to remember something. I also like to illustrate my, my stories and points with pictures of my children and grandchildren. <laughs> Learning starts with a goal. This is my grandson who, when I saw him at the time of this picture, which was about two months ago, could not crawl. My son said, he's getting ready to crawl. I said, getting ready, he's going to crawl in the next five minutes. I took a toy, and I put it in front of him, just out of reach that I knew he liked. He stamped his feet, he banged on, this, on, on, on the floor, and he couldn't get there. This picture was taken two minutes later, and it represents him starting to crawl all that distance with no effort whatsoever. What happened? He had motivation. No one had ever given him a reason to crawl before. I took his toy away. Education is like that. He wasn't trying to satisfy me. He didn't care about me. <laughs> he barely knows who I am. He wanted something. Learning starts when plans fail. Did I skip something? Oh, there's no sound. <laughs> You've seen this, I assume, from Indiana Jones. <laughs> the 
Why is that funny? Why is that interesting? Because we make the assumption that learning is about watching and living, but actually it's about failure. It's about expectation failure. You didn't expect that was going to happen. And so the next time, of course, this guy's dead, but the next time, you would remember. We have great plans, and the best thing that could happen to our great plans is that they fail, because it causes us to think about why they failed. Learning depends upon reminding. Listen to this man who was a former ambassador to the United States. And this is very important. This is the toilet paper index. If a country gets to the point where there's no toilet paper, there's going to be a revolution. All right, stop. And Chile got... Stop. Okay. <laughs> He's talking about Chile, and, uh, but that's not the point. The point is that we have experts all around the world who know things. If we were, had really intelligent computers, they would tell us the right thing at the right time. But we do have is intelligent minds. And our intelligent mind tells us just the right thing at the right time. Oh, I've experienced this before. I recognize that face. I know what to do here. It's not something you think about doing. It's something that experience accumulated will help you do. Learning is all about memory modification. This is a different one of my grandsons. He is about to jump on a trampoline for the first time. He will fall down. He will have to change his memory of what walking is like temporarily to adjust it for a piece of information that when you walk on a trampoline, it's different than when you walk on the grass. Little thing, but that's the kind of thing we learn constantly when we're little. That's my daughter catching a fish. She decided she needed to catch a fish, needed to go fishing, so for once and only her in her life, we went and caught a fish. She learned how to catch a fish, and if you can see from the expression on her face that she is very excited that she caught a fish. Learning also depends upon having goals you can satisfy. I did not give her an A grade in fish catching. I did not compliment her on catching a fish. She didn't need to be complimented. She had caught the fish. And more importantly, she had a story to tell about the time she caught a fish. When you find yourself telling stories about things you know that were exciting and interesting, that represents the truth of your education. That is your education. It's what you know. And you know when to tell it and when not to tell it. It's your accumulated wisdom. Maybe that's not so much wisdom in catching a fish. I know when I tell stories, they're very, very wise stories. Learning is an adventure. This is the same grandson you just saw on the trampoline. This time, learning to play guitar. No, not really. What he's doing is, he's only two years old, he's he was introduced to Guitar Hero, which is a video game. He has no idea how to do it or what to do. So I hurried up and bought him this when I saw this picture, which I didn't take, because I want him to learn what? I don't want him to learn to play guitar. I don't actually care. I want him to be excited to learn whatever he wants to learn. If he wants to learn guitars, he will learn them, not because I'm making him, not because I enrolled him in guitar school, but because he's motivated to do so on his own, because guitars interest him. So that's what there is to know about learning. But there, what is there to know about school? It looks like that. Those children are not there because they want to be there, and they're certainly not there because they want to learn. And what are they learning? They're learning to sit still. They're learning to be quiet. They're learning to be good little boys and girls. In fact, you all learned exactly the same thing because you're all sitting still and are quiet and good little boys and girls right now. <laughs> Despite the fact that you might want to walk out of the room and go to the bathroom or have a drink, here you are because you've learned this in school. It's not that much of an important lesson. Students do not actually hear lectures at all. If you don't believe me, watch these two video clips. One from the movie Ferris Bueller's Gave Off, Day Off, and the other from a student taking a picture of his college classroom as a joke. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot, Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. 
Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. Just before we play the second one, he, he's actually talking straight from the U.S. high school curriculum. I did, in fact, have to learn about the Smoot-Hawley tariff. I don't remember what it was. I have listened to this video a hundred times. I still don't remember what it was because I don't care. And the problem is, if I'm telling you something about which you do not care, you will not learn it. You might temporarily memorize it for the test, but you will not learn it. This is a college classroom in the United States. Bond. Watch the student because he's about to jump out the window. And what he's trying to show is that the teacher is paying no attention to the classroom whatsoever. She has her back to the students. She has no idea this is going on. The class is not paying attention to her at all. They are paying attention to him jumping out the window. She's still talking. <laughs> because school is a joke. It shouldn't be a joke. But we all remember that we always didn't take it as seriously as we were supposed to. Why should, is life like that? Do you find that when you learn in real life that you don't take it seriously? Let's suppose you're driving and you have a car accident. Would you say, well, I don't really need to learn from that? Or would you actually try to think about what caused it so maybe you wouldn't do it the next time? Or suppose you have a fight with your wife. Might, would you want to learn from that so that maybe it wouldn't happen another time? We don't find learning difficult. In fact, human beings love learning, except there, because what they don't love is classrooms. This is from the same movie. The first one I showed was from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This is Ferris Bueller. I don't know if you remember him. I don't know if you remember this movie. But he's acting as a student in high school, and he's telling you about what he's thinking about prior to this day. I do have a test today. That wasn't bullshit. It's on European socialism. I mean, really, what's the point? I'm not European. I don't plan on being European. So who gives a crap if they're socialists? They could be fascist anarchists. It still wouldn't change the fact that I don't own a car. Okay, I don't, you may not have understood that, I see, because you didn't laugh. He said, Europeans could be fascist anarchists. It wouldn't change the fact that I don't own a car. That's what he cares about. He cares about how can he own a car, and how can he impress girls, and how can he be cool. All right, why don't we teach that? Why don't we help him get better at being who he wants to be? He doesn't want to be a historian. Why are we bothering him with history? Now you may say, oh, it's very important to learn history. No, no. You've all been told that. You know, oh, it's very important to learn mathematics. No, you've all been told that. What is it very important to learn? If I asked any of you, what do you do on any given day? You would not tell me history or mathematics. You would tell me I speak, I listen, I jump to conclusions, I make decisions. That's what's important. That's it, what we need to have education about, not about the subjects that you learned in school. Now, I know that seems uncomfortable. You immediately think, no, mathematics is important. Really? Are you sure? I'm not talking about arithmetic. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are fine. I'm talking about the more advanced subjects. Are you think they're that important? The beginning and the end of the problem in school is that professors teach courses. We divide and compartmentalize things into discrete units of hours per, per day or hours per week and expect that students can go from one idea to the other and can maintain all these ideas in their mind while thinking original thoughts about them. 
But that's not what they're doing. Students are trying to game the system. Students are trying to figure out how to win with doing the least effort. That's a different story. Professors teach courses because it's easy. It's much easier than being there full time like a parent helping a child learn. Parenting is hard and parenting is real teaching. Teachers are authority figures. My children and my grandchildren never tried to get an A from me. They like to please me, but they don't say, hey, I learned to talk, is that okay? Did I do good? Talking and learning to talk is its own reward. Children learn to walk because they want to get something, or so, and they want to talk because they want to find their wishes get granted. The sense of natural goals driving learning is lost when you put the teacher in a position where he can do something to your life or tell you you're right or wrong. I used to teach my university classes and say quite often to students when they ask me something, well, I don't know, that's my opinion, who knows if it's right, it might be right. And they look at me like, but you're the professor, you're supposed to know what's right. Really? Do, I, do we all know what's right? Are we certain of everything that's right or wrong? Is that what the professor is, the arbiter of truth? I kept saying, come to your own truth. I'll be here to, to suggest things and to discuss with you. I don't know the answers, I have my opinions. Maybe they're more informed than yours because I'm more educated and live longer, but that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your own point of view. The real role of a teacher is the same as the role of a parent and is the same role as a coach. To be there to help you in a given moment when you need some help. To be there at the moment of need. That's the value, true value of education. And testing, which in my country we become obsessed with testing. And your country will soon become obsessed with testing, testing because we like to export our worst products and you will buy them. And testing is the worst product we have ever put out for the world to buy. Students are now being tested at every single grade from the point of their six years old to the point where they graduate college in the United States. It is very sad. Here's a movie, movie makers know about education. I can find endless movies making fun of education that are right on. Here's one. No, what were you supposed to play that clip? Exam. Now remember, the quadratic formula is x equals negative b plus or minus the radical of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Everybody write this down and commit it to memory. You will need it. Pete, out please. Why will you need the quadratic equation? How many of you have needed the quadratic equation? <laughs> How many of you even know the quadratic equation? Don't feel shy. I was a math major. I don't know the quadratic equation. I was a computer science professor. I have no use for algebra in any of its forms. It never comes up. Then why is every student in the world taught the quadratic formula? I actually know why. I'm going to tell you in a minute. It isn't because you need to know it. The United States had a president who understood education. Unfortunately, he was the president in 1800. He said, there were two types of education. One should teach us how to make a living, and the other should teach us how to live. John Adams, the most brilliant and simple remark ever made about education. He was ignored. A lot of wise people have thought about education. I am not the first person to think about it. Let's see what some of them said. Plato. Plato says the only way we learn is by doing. If you want to teach somebody to build houses, have him build houses when he's little. If you want to teach him to be a farmer, have him be a farmer when he's little. Education is involved practice, 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 learning by doing, learning by doing, learning by doing. It's the only way we learn. John Dewey, the very famous American educator, said, the reason school is reduced to a set of predigested facts and truths is it's because it's easier to teach that way and it's easier to test that way, but it, it is of no use. No one remembers it. Albert Einstein said, reading after a certain age diverts the mind from creative pursuits. Any man who reads too much and uses his brain too little falls into lazy, habit, lazy habits of thinking. Did you think that that Einstein would be against reading? It turns out Socrates was also against reading. You may think, well, what kind of crazy person says you shouldn't read? Well, Albert Einstein. Why? Because what he's telling you is if you find the truth as told by others, you don't find the truth yourself. 
You need to come to your, I used to tell my graduate students, if you want to know something, come up with your own answer first, read second, not the other way around. Other way around, you'll learn to appreciate Plato instead of inventing Plato. Immanuel Kant, all our knowledge begins with experience. Gee, that doesn't seem so radical. Then why isn't school all about experiences? More experiences and more experiences. I don't consider, consider sitting in a classroom to be an experience. Descartes, the end study of mind should be to be able to make good and sound judgments before which matters would come before you. Why isn't school all about making good judgments? John Locke, the best way to come to know things is the truth is to examine things as they are, not to include how they are as we fancy ourselves or been taught by others to imagine. In other words, coming to see the world on your own terms and then having a teacher help you rather than the other way around. A proper curriculum, therefore, should do all these things. It should teach you how to make a living. It should allow practice. It should not be concerned with facts. It should not be driven by reading. It should be driven by experiences. It should enable good judgment. And it should enable examinations of situations. Does that seem very radical? But we don't do it. Why not? That's why not. In the United States, that's why not. I'm sure there's a, a person I could put up in Spain for you, but I don't know him. This is the guy. He was the president of Harvard in 1892. He decided the United States should have a standardized curriculum in high school. Before I get to that, I always want to point to a little, a little quote that I rather like. I'm sure the reason such young nitwits are produced in our schools is because they have no contact with anything of any use in everyday life. You want to know who said that? Can you imagine who said that? Petronius in Rome, 66 AD. 2,000 years ago, the situation was identical. <laughs> Harvard in 1892, the subjects of study in Harvard were exactly and only these, nothing more than this. English, Greek, Latin, German, French, ancient history, modern history, algebra, plane geometry, physical sciences, logarithms and trigonometry, solid geometry, physics, chemistry. Does that look like the high school curriculum? That is the high school curriculum in the United States exactly word for word. It has not changed since 1892, not one bit. I don't know the Spanish high school curriculum, but I'm willing to bet it looks very similar. That was popular in 1892. You want to know why the quadratic equation is taught? It was popular in 1892. How will these subjects help you get a job? How will these subjects help you learn, live well? How will learning mathematics and la languages, I can understand, science and history help you live better? And you know, I know you're thinking, oh, well, but it's important because, but try to remember whatever you're thinking was important because, some teacher taught you that. You didn't, you didn't come to that conclusion on your own. It's about performance. It's not about competence, it's about performance. How do we teach performance? Performance is not typically a conscious process. That's the problem with it. Most schooling involves conscious knowledge. Things we say we know that we can say we know in words. What's conscious knowledge? Conscious knowledge is being able to recognize who that is. This not being an American audience, you may not recognize him as the first president of the United States. Every American knows who that is. It's, not, it's conscious knowledge. We learn it. You didn't learn it? Fine. Conscious knowledge is included in encyclopedias, all the conscious truths that we know, official truths. I, through some random set of events, was once on the board of editors of Encyclopedia Britannica, that encyclopedia. <laughs> I asked them, well, suppose we could make the encyclopedia 10 times bigger. Would we have, could we put in more facts and truths? Would you do that if it didn't cost any more to produce it? And they said, no, no, we have exactly the right facts and truths and the right amount of facts and truths in there. This was, I was trying to advise them about the web, which they didn't, hadn't been invented yet, but I knew it was coming, I, which of course is totally destroyed Encyclopedia Britannica because it, it has destroyed the notion that the truths are exactly what we said they were and no more. Conscious knowledge can easily be tested and that's why we teach it. This is an American comedian. You may not understand him exactly because he speaks quickly. I will, he's also talking in a fake Italian accent, but I will translate a little bit after it's over. I find that education 
I think it don't matter where you go to school. Italy, America, Brazil, it's all the same. It's all just a memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything, just so you can parrot it back for the test. <laughs> and I got this idea for a school I would like to start. Something called the Five Minute University. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she is out of school. <laughs> Would the cost of like $20? You know, like in college, you have to take foreign language. Well, at the five-minute university, you can have your choice. Any language you want, you can take it. Say if you want to take Spanish, what I teach you is, como esta usted? That means, how are you? And the answer is, muy bien means very well. And believe me, if you took two years of college Spanish, five years after you're out of school, como esta usted muy bien, about all you're gonna remember. <laughs> so in my school, that's all you learn. You see, you don't have to waste your time with the conjugations, vocabulary, all that the junk. You just forget it anyway, now what's the difference? <laughs> Economics? Supply and demand. <laughs> That's it. And I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, right next door to the Five Minute University, I might have opened up a little law school. <laughs> you know, you got another minute? <laughs> Well, I see a lot of you didn't understand it. So uh, the quick translation is he says, all you ever remember from school is that it can be remembered and taught in five minutes. So if you take two years of college Spanish, uh, all you'll ever remember is como esta usted muy bien. So he said, I'll just teach you that. And if you took years of economics, all you ever remember is supply and demand. So I'll just say supply and demand and be done with it. And he says, this is true of every school in the world. And I believe that he's right. And this is, this is a 30-year-old joke, but it, nothing's changed. Non-conscious knowledge. Uh, this is from an American uh, talk, but this is the, if you play, throw a football like, and you hit a baseball to American sports, you don't know how you did it. How do I know you don't know how you did it? Because I can interview the athletes who usually are not very smart, and they couldn't tell you a thing about how they do it. But the best athletes in the world just do it. So here in soccer, whoever the best soccer player is in Spain, I'm pretty sure he couldn't tell you why he's the best soccer player in Spain in any way that actually was true. He wouldn't tell you how to kick better than other people kick. He doesn't know. It's not conscious knowledge. Throughout human history, people have understood that if you want to become an expert at something, what you have to do is copy, or to put it another way, be an apprentice to somebody and do what they do and practice it. So instead of going to medical school and learning all the facts, what you need to do is hang around and learn as you're doing it. We don't do it that way anymore. We used to do it that way, curiously. Then we built medical school. Our ancestors, and we should remember that our ancestors are not so far away in evolutionary terms. So we have actually been around for 50,000 or 100,000 years or whatever the number is, um, and we're just a little blip on that history, which means that we don't learn and behave very much differently than people long before did. And how did those people learn? Well, they didn't sit around and listen to lectures. They followed, as these pictures of modern day cavemen do, they followed around the adults and they tried to practice and imitate what the adults did until they got better at it. How could learning be any other way in a society in which doing was everything? A practitioner of a craft may know a little bit about how to answer a question, but does he always know what he knows? For example, I spend a lot of time giving lectures. Do I know how to give a lecture? Well, maybe, but if you ask me, well, what do you do to give a lecture? I don't, I don't know, I talk. In fact, I don't even know where the words come from. I barely know where the ideas come from. I just sort of do it. And anything that we do that we're expert at doing, we really don't necessarily know how that works. So that is not the kind of classroom I want. That's the kind of classroom I want, where kids are doing things together and trying to accomplish things. People can learn practice through procedures through practice. Anything you want people to learn, you have to have them practice, practice, practice. 
Evidence also suggests that human beings have extraordinary memory and recall. So it has to do, how, what do we need to recall? Experiences. So we have to have our experiences and enough experiences that we can, re we can recall them at the right moment. Recall is not a conscious process. We don't know how we do it. I see. Okay. Non-conscious knowledge. Well, you drive a car, you don't know how you're doing it. In fact, if you ever notice, if you go one place regularly and then you decide to change your mind, sometimes you'll wind up in the place you didn't intend to go. Because what happens is the non-conscious is doing the driving. Non-conscious knowledge. Who is that? You don't know how you know it. You don't measure the amount of distance between her lips and her mouth and her hair. You just know it. How's this date going? They like each other? What's going to happen next? How do you know? I don't know. You know. That's how you know. <laughs> That's a, to tell you a story. Just to give you an idea about how unconscious works. I was giving a talk in Enschede, which is in the Netherlands, in the um, eastern, eastern part of Holland. And I took a trip from Enschede. I think I have this on the map. Yes? Next? No? No. Um, I took a trip in, in, from Enschede to Amsterdam on the train after the lecture. And as I approached the train station in Amersfoort, I started to think about a little girl that I knew when I was young, in my school, whose last name was Narden. I had no idea why I was thinking about her. I don't think about her very much, but Narden is a Dutch name, and I knew that. The next train stop after Amersfoort was Narden. Now, that's pretty impressive. How did that happen, says I to me. Well, I could have heard somebody say Narden, but I didn't. I could have been look, seeing a sign, but I was reading a newspaper. So I had an idea that maybe I'd been around on this track before. Well, the last time I'd been in the Netherlands was a few years ago, and I'd been in Groningen, all the way in the north of Holland. So I went back to the back of the train to look for the map, which I thought I would find there, and there it was. And that map showed that the train from Groningen met the train from Enschede at Amersfoort. Or to put this another way, I had been there before. But if you had asked me, what's the central train station uh, stop in, on, the, on the Groningen line, I would not have known. If you had asked me, what station is after Amersfoort, I would have said, where is Amersfoort? If you had said to me, is there a town in Netherlands called Narden, I would have said, I don't know, but I knew a little girl with that name. I didn't know what I knew. We, in general, don't know what we know. That's the problem with school because it tries to teach conscious knowledge, the stuff we know we know, like the quadratic formula. Unfortunately, we have no use for it, so it doesn't become ingrained in our lives. Performance knowledge is not conscious. So how do we teach it? Every curriculum must tell a story, and by that I mean we teach it by creating experiences, as if you were in a movie that lasted for a year. And all you did was pretend to be in a situation which you're trying to learn how to function in. How do we determine the story? Well, we might ask the question, if the people who are in this program graduated, what are they going to do? What do you do when you enter the workforce? What do you do when you become a, a senior accountant? What do you do when you become a lawyer? And then, with that in mind, understand how to design a curriculum that looks and feels like the situation you would encounter when you, gra when you after graduation, and have that be what school is like before graduation. So no longer do people actually say, well, these kids don't know anything and now I have to retrain them. No longer do there have to be corporate universities which are taking the place of schools which didn't do their job in the first place. Then you create a set of situations. How do you do that? By asking people the kinds of situations that happen in, in work and in real life, and then simulating them in a way that looks and feels realistic so that students can try to deliver the kinds of things they would have to deliver later on before they get there. These are called goal-based scenarios. A goal-based scenario means we have a clear, defined goal. The goal is either great fun or obviously necessary. The scenario is designed to achieve that goal. The teacher is just there helping. The student is playing a role in that goal-based scenario. A story-centered curriculum. The teacher sets out the task. The students work together in groups to try to figure out what needs to be done. When a student needs help, which of course he will because we have asked him to do something he does not know how to do, 
He can ask the teacher who may or may not answer. He can, what would happen? He can ask the mentor. We have somebody there, stand by by telephone or by instant message, ready to answer. He can ask his fellow students. He can consult a book. Or he can go on the web where we have provided the kind of help he needs on a website. Learning this way is a one-on-many experience. Learning is just in time. Anytime you learn anything, it's to help you do something you're trying to accomplish at that moment. The students create a plan of attack. They divide the work amongst themselves. They seek mentoring. They discuss their initial results. They create deliverables, and they get feedback. I've done this in a number of places. One of the places I did was Carnegie Mellon University. And Carnegie Mellon University had a, an e-business program. One of the things they did there was they taught business plan writing. I said to the business professor, what do you teach about business plan writing that I couldn't find in a book? He says, nothing. I said, then who needs you? He said, well, that's what I do. I teach a course in business plan writing. I said, I'll tell you who needs you. I will create, the students having to, I will create a situation where students have to write a business plan, and we will have a, a realistic simulation of circumstances so they'll write this business plan. I want you to do is read it. And I don't want you to read it and give an A or a B or a C. I want you to read it and write criticisms and go back to them so they can improve it until they get it right. Not for a grade, but so they actually understand how to write a good business plan. And they're done when they're done. So the teacher evaluates, but can send back feedback. Suppose we created a system that was meant to teach students real life skills instead of academic skills. I go around and I ask people, well, if we were to do that, what would we do? Here are some of the answers I get. Hotel management, law, media production, architecture, biotechnology, finance, construction, telecommunications. I have been building a variety of these online for, as high school experiences, meant to replace the existing academic curriculum, and similarly in master's degree programs. How do we build them? First, we convene a group of experts, then we... Whoop, what, we're going, you're going the wrong way here. All right. First, we convene a group of experts. Whoop. <laughs> Can we go forward one? Okay. First, we create a, find a group of experts. Then we establish what goal it is that people would have at the end. And then we try to work back. We just did that yesterday at, 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 with Ramon and, the, and m many of the teachers at BES to try and understand how we could do a new business curriculum that would be maybe a replacement someday for an MBA. How would we deliver this? Well, you can deliver it in school or online. It doesn't matter. All the materials are on the web. The students can work together physically in front of each other, or they can work together online in remote teams. We deliver it either way. Mentors are sometimes nearby, or, and sometimes they're in the classroom, and sometimes they're a thousand miles away. We don't care. The modern era of education is not about physical proximity to the teacher or to the other students. It's about instant access to new kinds of information sources and new kinds of experiences and working with people to achieve, to achieve deliverables in a finite amount of time. How would we select what to build? I'm in the habit of going around to various parts of the world and asking questions like, well, what would you need here? And my favorite answer was in New Mexico, which is a state in the United States, which is a large American Indian population. And American Indians are allowed to run casinos for reasons that are obscure, but you can go to casinos if they're owned by Indians. And so when I said to the American Indian school, well, what curriculum should I build for you? They said, casino management. That's their need. <laughs> But no one will listen to them. Instead, they're learning algebra. When I said to the people in Kansas, what's your need? They said, hotel management. I didn't even know there were hotels in Kansas, but apparently there are a lot of them. When I said to the people in, in, in Peru, what do you need? They said, well, we have a lot of fast food restaurants around here. We need restaurant management. You get practical answers. Why not start teaching those things that really matter to the people in their lives? By the way, you can use those things as a vehicle to teach anything. All our curricula teach reasoning and writing and communication and getting along with other people and working in teams and coming to conclusions and making decisions and all those things that really do matter. It doesn't matter what the context is. So the result of life in a story-centered curriculum is that you have already experienced virtually 
what you can, are going to go experience in, rea in reality later on. And if you think about it, there are some things that it's very sad we don't have curricula for. One of my favorite things to mention is child raising. We let people raise children without ever forcing them to take a course. We force them to take a course in algebra, but not in child raising. Why would that be? Why wouldn't we make everyone have a story-centered curriculum about child raising? Isn't that important? I would think it's important. I don't get it. I have a mission here. I'm here for a reason. My reason is to help change education. That's what I'm about. I believe very strongly that the partnership between uh, me and Ramon and essentially my, my people and his people has a great possibility for success. And I thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to do this.